back to throw. Looks, fires into the end zone. Touchdown, Ike Curtis. He's over to 25 to the 30 yard line, and Kenny Riley picked it out of the air. Right by Pete Johnson, down to the 30. 25, 20, down to the 15, still on his feet. Five, touchdown. It's worth touchdown. She wasn't built to be charming. She wasn't configured to fit inside a neighborhood like her predecessor, Crosley Field. Riverfront Stadium was designed to function. A multi-purpose machine, her concrete and steel body bolted down along the Ohio River, sharing the banks with warehouses, factories, skyscrapers. She had a job to do, and she did it well. And for those of us that were lucky enough to have our breath taken away by her majestic size, our eyes widened when we first saw her expansive green field as we made our way to find our plastic seats of blue, green, yellow, or red. We are forever grateful that she let us be a part of her lifespan. She is forever with us, and we will always have that stadium along the Ohio riverfront. On a cold and cloudy Cincinnati day, on December 14, 1965, a luncheon attended by 125 businessmen was held at the Sheraton Gibson Hotel in downtown. It was put together by Ohio Governor James Rhodes in an effort to move along plans for a multi-sport stadium that would keep the Reds in Cincinnati and likely secure a professional football franchise. As a fiery Governor Rhodes spoke of the benefits a pro football team and stadium could bring the Queen City, Paul Brown, a surprise guest of Rhodes, stood waiting in the wings. After being introduced, Brown spoke to the enamored crowd, reiterating the words of Governor Rhodes and emphasizing that now was the time for a stadium and that stadium would put Cincinnati on the pro football map. It was only six short weeks prior to that luncheon that Brown was asked by his longtime friend William Hackett about his interest in possibly being a commissioner of the NFL. Hackett was a former player under Brown at Ohio State, an All-American guard and national champion. Brown's response to Hackett, I don't want to be a commissioner. I want to run a team. Hackett agreed and plans were set in motion. Hackett was a veterinarian at Orlington Farms in London, Ohio, which was run by successful businessman John Sawyer. Along with Paul's son Mike, a Cleveland attorney, they convinced Paul Brown that Cincinnati would be a perfect fit. Brown left the luncheon that day confident that if the city could get him that stadium, he would get them a professional football team. The idea of having a large multi-sport stadium dates back to 1925 when the Reds were looking to build a 50,000-seat multi-sport park before their lease with Redland Field was set to expire in 1929. Several sites were considered, with the corner of Bates Alley and Colerain Avenue being the favorite, but no deal for the land could be reached. In 1929, with their lease set to expire, the Reds purchased Redland Field and the land on which the grandstand stood for $195,000. When talks of riverfront development began to heat up in the mid-1940s, the 
the idea of a large multi-sport stadium was once again rekindled. Besides the development of Fort Washington Way and the eventual Expressway, riverfront development would be put on hold. It wasn't until 1956, when the Reds once again were enticed to move on to bigger and better things, that a stadium project would be taken seriously. In fact, from 1956 to 1966, eight different stadium sites were proposed, including Springfield, Lunkin Playfield, Carthage, Broadway Commons, Blue Ash, Tri-County, the future site of Kings Island, and the riverfront. With Paul Brown and a pro football team in the picture, Cincinnati realized that if they wanted to be a major league city, they needed a modern major league stadium that could house both teams. When the dust settled, the riverfront site was chosen. The Bengals would enter the league in 1968 and in their first two years of existence would call Nippert Stadium at the University of Cincinnati home while they awaited for their permanent home to be built along the river. On April 26, 1966, the Atlanta architectural firms Heary & Heary Finch, Alexander Barnes Rothschild and Paschal, the same designers responsible for Atlanta's Fulton County Stadium, were hired to design the new stadium along the river. Many designs were made, including a horseshoe open-ended park, an enclosed circular structure, and a dome. The circular structure, much like the stadium in Atlanta, won the day. It was designed by James Finch, a former Marine whose company famously placed the flag high atop Mount Suribachi during World War II. The official groundbreaking was held on February 1, 1968, with representatives from the city, county, the Reds, and the Bengals, including Paul Brown, pushing a ceremonial plunger. Another ceremony included nine-year-old Jay Allgood pushing buttons on an electronic board that set off smoke bombs placed where the bases and the goalposts would be located. The stadium complex sat on 48 acres of land and was made up of 175,000 cubic yards of concrete and 100,000 tons of steel. The new feature of the stadium would be an all AstroTurf field, the first all AstroTurf stadium ever constructed. 117,460 square feet of turf was installed by the Monsanto Company of St. Louis. The process consisted of layering eight inches of crushed gravel, four inches of blacktop, a half inch of insulite rubber pad, and then another half inch of AstroTurf. 
The lighting system consisted of three rows of 1,728 1,000 watt bulbs that circled the stadium. A 140 foot long, 20 foot high electronic scoreboard with 31,720 40 watt gas filled bulbs sat high above the stadium under the lighting structure. Perhaps the most iconic visual while inside the stadium was the multicolored seats. Originally, the plan was to have top levels of blue and gold, the plaza level red, and the field level green. But Reds officials stepped in with the thought that since most seats were top level, they should be Cincinnati red. In January of 1970, five months before it was to open, Cincinnati City Council officially named the new stadium Riverfront Stadium. The task of converting the stadium from baseball to football was not an easy one. In an 18 to 24 hour span, a workforce of 50 plus men would remove the pitcher's mound, cover the base cutouts and warning track, remove a portion of the outfield fence, and move an entire section of seats before washing away and repainting end zone and yard lines. The pitcher's mound sat on a steel plate that was dug out and carefully removed. The base cutouts were covered with patches of AstroTurf. The third base side blue seats, sections 141 to 159, were moved on a railroad-like track, which was powered by five motors. The seats were then pushed into left center field to be parallel with the first base side blue seats. 1,500 pounds of water pressure was required to remove infield and foul lines. When the baseball season was over, an extra 4,000 temporary seats called demountables were installed behind the end zones with an additional 2,000 seats installed in the blue, green, and yellow sections. Riverfront Stadium opened to the Cincinnati Reds on June 30, 1970. And after a few months of baseball, it was finally football's turn. On August 8, 1970, Washington came to town to play the Bengals in the first ever football game to be played in the stadium. 52,299 fans saw Cincinnati beat Washington 27-12. When Bengals running back Jess Phillips dove into the end zone in the first quarter, the scoreboard flashed the word touchdown, followed by animated fireworks and a roaring Bengal Tiger. Six weeks later, Paul Brown and his Bengals opened the regular season at Riverfront against John Madden's Raiders. In the first quarter, Sam Weish scampered five yards, scoring the first regular season touchdown and leading the Bengals to a 31-21 victory. The Riverfront years were off and running. the Bengals would capture the AFC Central title by beating the Boston Patriots that first year at Riverfront. One of the features at Riverfront Stadium that carried over from the Nipper years was Bird's Bengal Band. The band was led by George Bird, a friend of Paul Brown's from his Massillon and Cleveland days. Bird was the composer of the Bengals' growl, which was played during pregame and after touchdowns but the Bengals growl forever lived on with the lyrics posted on the scoreboard to encourage the crowd to sing along.
the jungle didn't happen overnight. In fact, as the 70s exited, a new era of embracing the Bengal tiger image began. There were new stripes and a new rallying cry that would echo throughout the stadium. Who Day. The origin of the original Who Day chant has long been debated. It is said to have come from fans high up in the red seats and in the surrounding bars along the riverfront. But it was WEBN program director Denton Marr who had heard the chant at a game in September of 1981. He talked some colleagues at the station into recording a version of it, which was played frequently during the remarkable 81-82 Super Bowl season. Seven years later, Riverfront Stadium would take on a new identity, an identity that carries on today, and it began with five guys from Wilmington, Ohio. On October 8, 1988, Dwayne DeWeese, Kyle Murphy, Marty Marshall, Cam Storer, and Jason Nichols were at a party the night before they were to attend the Bengals and Jets game at Riverfront Stadium. They had heard the song, Welcome to the Jungle, the newly released single by Guns N' Roses from their album, Appetite for Destruction. An idea was hatched. At around 10.30 p.m., the men raided a linen closet for a bedsheet, grabbed some orange and black spray paint, and created a banner that would forever change the Bengals and the stadium in which they played. The banner caught the attention of Jerry Moss of JTM Meats. He loved the slogan and the idea of giving Riverfront a nickname. JTM's people contacted 700 WLW's people, and combining their efforts, the two companies printed 3,000 bright orange placards that they distributed at the next home game versus Houston. The nickname The Jungle seemed to gain more credibility after the Bengals lost at Cleveland on October 30th, when quarterback Boomer Esiason exclaimed after the game that the Bengals would have a better outcome when the Browns possibly came to the jungle for the playoffs. The seed had been planted, and Riverfront Stadium was transformed into the jungle, with the Bengals going undefeated at home during their 88-89 Super Bowl run. of this day, Ken Riley Day. I'd like to thank the entire Bingham management, Coach Brown, the staff. I'd like to thank Coach Greg, the coaching staff, my teammates, 
and especially you, the fans. The final Cincinnati Bengals game at Riverfront Stadium, renamed Synergy Field in 1996, was on December the 12th, 1999, when fittingly, the Bengals beat the Browns in front of 59,972 fans. The final Bengals touchdown was a 52-yard pass from Jeff Blake to Darnay Scott in the third quarter. December the 29th, 2002, at 8 a.m., Riverfront Stadium was imploded. A stadium that took decades to bring to life was brought down in just 37 seconds. But we must never forget the performers who performed there during her 29 years, 2 months, and 23 days. The men who heard our cheers, our jeers, and made the jungle what it was. We must remember Anderson to Curtis, Boomer to Brown, backs that scampered on the plastic turf, the offensive lines that protected so the playmakers could make plays, the defenses that rose to the challenge when the jungle roared mightily. We must remember the Freezer Bowl and the original Hootay squad, and the home of the dominating performance of the 88 season, the SWAT team, the Icky Shuffle, Shake and Blake, or Corey Dillon's run to the record books. Riverfront Stadium was our Roman Coliseum, the football equivalent of the Gladiator Arena. And when it roared, there was no other home field advantage like it in the league. And although it's easy to diminish the unassuming architecture, it was built in a blue collar town and the functionality of that concrete and steel structure served a purpose. And we are forever grateful that in the 1960s, Paul Brown decided to call Cincinnati and Riverfront Stadium home. I came here because I felt at home here. Don't let it, Cleveland! Yes!